We don't know where she is, we don't know where she was going, and we don't know what happened to her. A witness saw her walking away from the accident. How does a person disappear when there's three people watching? Murray was a star cross-country runner in high school, one of the top two-mile runners in the state of Massachusetts. I think Maura found out she was pregnant. You cannot trust anybody, her family, policemen, people who were on the scene. What did you do, mister? You will become obsessed with this case. Today, I want to talk about what happened to Maura Murray. This case to me is so insane because there's so much information that's already out there, like the crazy internet searches she did, phone records, surveillance footage. But even with all of that, there's still a lot of questions that are left unanswered, which is why this case is still unsolved. And there are so many conspiracy theories about what happened to her. A lot of people think she like faked her disappearance to reinvent herself. Then there are people that think like something horrible happened to her, which is why I have on the tinfoil hat because some people actually started accusing the officer that responded to the scene as being involved and then he ended up taking his own life. And so it just the whole thing is insane. So I want to do what I usually do on my channel, which is I'm going to give you guys the facts and then we'll discuss the theories and then you can decide for yourself. So the whole thing started on February 9th, 2004 at 727 p.m. That's when Faith Westman called 911. She said she heard this loud noise outside of her home and when she looked out the window, she saw a car. It was a black Saturn and it was, according to her, in a ditch. It was facing like the opposite way of traffic and this was off Route 112 in Haverhill, New Hampshire. This is where you get your first inconsistency because when Faith called 911, she said that she saw a man in the vehicle smoking a cigarette because it was like the red light of someone smoking a cigarette. Later on, however, her husband, who was also there, said that when he looked out the window, he saw a woman who was on her cell phone and that red light that his wife thought was the light from a cigarette was actually red light from a cell phone. After that happens, there is a bus driver who lives very close to where this crash happened and he pulls up to this vehicle and he says that there was a woman in the vehicle. She came out of the car. He said she looked shaken up, but he didn't see any blood or any injuries. Just asked her how she was. She said she was shaken up. I couldn't see any blood. She didn't seem intoxicated to him. Uh, he noticed the airbags were deployed. And so he tells her, do you want me to call the cops? And she says to him, no, I just called AAA. They're on their way. It's fine. So the bus driver is like, okay, do you need a ride? You know, I live close by. She's like, no, it's fine. He says, okay, he leaves. Now this bus driver, he says that when he leaves, he knows this area, there is no cell service. He believes there's no way she could have called AAA. So when he gets home, he calls 911. Again, now we have a little bit of like contradiction with the timeline because according to police records at 7.46 p.m., a police cruiser arrived at the scene and this was the officer Cecil Smith. There's another witness who claims that they were driving on this freeway and they noticed not a police cruiser with the numbers 002, which is what Officer Cecil Smith was driving, but that they saw another cruiser with the numbers 001, and it wasn't a cruiser, sorry, it was an SUV. They claimed that they were driving this SUV, put its lights on and passed them, and that later on at 7.37 p.m. that they saw the black Saturn that had crashed, and it was nose to nose, like this, with the 001 police SUV facing it like this at 737. Faith, who called, and Bruce Atwood, who also called, they both say they never saw this 001 SUV. They only saw the 002 cruiser that Officer Cecil Smith was driving. So I don't know 
what you want to do with that, but that's something that I noticed when I was looking into it. There's like a bit of confusion there. When he arrives, he sees the vehicle, but he doesn't see anyone else. He notices right away that the doors are locked. And when he looks into the vehicle, he sees that there's a box of wine, Franzia red wine, and that there are red stains in and around the vehicle. And the airbags were deployed, but there's no one there. So from there, he goes to the bus driver's home, the one who called 911, and he tells the bus driver, like, where is the girl? She's not there. So then from there together, the officer and the bus driver, they go and they look around. They don't see anyone. According to the officer, there were no signs of foul play. And there were also no footsteps, because keep in mind, it was snowing at the time. There were no footsteps that were leading into like the wilderness doesn't seem like there was a struggle. First thing that they notice is that there is a strong smell of alcohol in the car. Now remember there was that box of wine that had been damaged and spilled everywhere, but also they found a uh, soda bottle that had a red liquid in it. And they said that when they opened the soda bottle, there was a strong smell of alcohol. And they immediately determined that whoever was driving this vehicle had been drinking and driving. By 7.54 p.m., Officer Smith puts out the bolo, which is like, be on the lookout for a female that is about five foot seven on foot. What did they find in the vehicle? They found a triple A card that was issued to Maura Murray. They found blank accident report forms from the DMV. They found gloves, CDs, makeup, jewelry, map quest directions that were printed out to Burlington, Vermont. They found a stuffed animal, college textbooks, and a book that was titled Not Without Peril, 150 Years of Misadventure on the Presidential Range of New Hampshire. And it was basically this book that talked about um, sort of stories of hikers who had like tragic endings to their expeditions in this area that wasn't too far away from when this crash happened. They also found that there was like a rag that was stuffed into the uh, muffler pipe of the vehicle. As for things that were missing, Maura Murray's debit card and her credit cards, her cell phone, the charger, and her backpack. And when it comes to like her cell phone and her credit cards, those things have never been used after this crash. Sometime between 8 and 8.30, there is a witness who says they saw a woman who was matching Maura Murray's description that was, quote, running eastbound on Route 112, about four to five miles east of where the vehicle was discovered. Two days after the crash on February 11th, Mara's father arrives and the search begins. And they have police dogs search for her. And at first they're tracing her scent about 300 feet from where her vehicle crashed, like to the east is when the dogs lost her scent. And so based on that, police were saying that they think she got into a vehicle in that area and that's why they lost the scent. Also at around this time, Mara, she had a long distance boyfriend, his name is Bill. So he arrives at the area like where she went missing and he tells police that when he was on the flight, he got a call that resulted in a voicemail. And he says, quote, I could hear only breathing. And then towards the end of the voicemail, I heard what was apparent to be crying and then a whimper, which I'm certain was Mora. They eventually track this call and it's to a prepaid calling card. And they track that calling card to the American Red Cross. And then this is also kind of like fuzzy because I found certain articles that were saying that her boyfriend's mom would give her calling cards and she was known to use calling cards. So the boyfriend had to take emergency leave because he was in the military and that the Red Cross could have coordinated that. They come out, the police, and they say that there is a missing person. They give Maura's description and they say that she's possibly, quote, 
suicidal. I need to give you guys the backstory because to understand like her frame of mind in that moment, you have to know like the buildup of how we got here because although on the surface and when you first look into the case, it seems like Mora's like this, you know, overachiever, star athlete, very smart academically, and that is all true. There were certain things about her life that were kind of out of control. So I want to talk about that. She was part of the National Honor Society in her high school, but also she was described as a star athlete in her high school's track team. After high school, Mara gets accepted into West Point Military Academy, which is really hard to get into. They have like a super low acceptance rate, I think like 10% acceptance rate. And she gets in, she's studying chemical engineering. And this is also where she meets her boyfriend, Billy, the one I told you about with the voicemail. They were both at West Point. The thing is, is that Mora only stayed in West Point for her freshman year. She would end up transferring after that. And she did get in trouble at West Point. And this is a recurring theme, but she was stealing. So according to her friend, a former student there, she said that they were on this training trip in July of 2001 in Fort Knox and Mora got in trouble for stealing makeup from the commissary that it was only five dollars worth of makeup but you know she was singled out and penalized for it and then according to this friend Mora was quote insanely smart but also had inner demons this friend said that Mora was bulimic and that she seemed sad and quote, had issues with loving herself. Mora wouldn't stay at West Point long. After a year, she ends up transferring to University of Massachusetts Amherst, which is where she's studying nursing. That's where she was when she went missing. Even though she transferred and she was no longer near Billy, they were still together. They just had a long distance relationship. The thing about it was, is that there were rumors, rumors that the relationship was troubled. There were rumors of cheating. And there's actually this um, person that Mara apparently had a relationship with who was a coach, uh, a track and field coach. Like, okay, so here, here's what happened. His name is Hussein Baghdadi, but he goes by Haas. At the time that they started their relationship, she was no longer running track. However, they still kept it a secret because, you know, it was a little bit touchy. According to this guy Haas and a bunch of Mora's friends, they all say that in the spring of 2003, Mora said she broke up with Billy. They had a hot and heavy relationship. It lasted into the summer. And then according to Haas, all of a sudden around that time, she quote, dropped off the face of the planet. She would not answer his calls or his emails or anything. And then when fall of 2003 came around and classes started back up again, Mara appeared and she told Haas like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm back with Billy now. That's why I wasn't answering your calls. And according to this guy, Haas, I want to read you like what he said. He says he seemed very chauvinistic. He wanted her to be in certain places at certain times. He was checking up on her. I think he was demanding with her, but that's just the impression I got. He said he also got the impression that he could be physical and that Mara felt she couldn't really get away from him. After she went missing and detectives did some research and they found out about this relationship with Haas, they went and they questioned him. And he says that he told police, quote, that she talked about running away. She said, I wish I could disappear. When I heard that she was missing, I thought, holy crap, maybe she did it. That he learned that Mara had been sleeping with other members of the track team, quote, she was very promiscuous, it turns out, he said. But then he also said that it, he didn't hold it against her, that, quote, she was super energetic, always seemed happy, but she was sad too underneath. I want to put this in the context of the timeline, right? February 2004 is when she goes missing. Prior to that, spring, summer, she's having this relationship with Haas. By the time fall rolls around, she's with Billy. She's back in school, and then something happens. November 2003, 
Mora gets in trouble again. Remember how she got caught stealing in West Point? Well, she gets caught stealing again. Basically what happened is that there was this girl in her dorm who found some unauthorized charges on her credit card from local restaurants in the area. They added up to $79. And so she ends up going to the police to file a report. So the cops end up calling these restaurants and telling them like, hey, this credit card number, like someone ordered from you, but it, it's a fraudulent order. Well, guess what? Right after the cops call this one particular restaurant to tell them about this, someone calls the restaurant to make an order using the exact credit card number that was part of this fraud situation. So the restaurant takes the order, they call the cops, they tell the cops like, hey, you know, the number you called, someone just called and made an order. So they're like, oh my God, we have the person who is like, stole this credit card and is making this order. So they end up like setting up like a sting operation. And so the cops follow the delivery person. The delivery person gets to the dorm. Maura Murray gets the order and signs the receipt. As soon as Maura signs the receipt for that order, the police show up and they actually took like her mugshot right then and there at the dorms. She gets arrested. So that happened November 3rd. 2003, which is just three months before she goes missing. What ended up happening was in December, she had a court date. The judge basically says, if you pay the $79 and you stay out of trouble for three months, don't break the law for three months, this will completely be removed from your record. Now, if she were to get in trouble within that three months, now she's trying to be a nurse, right? And they do all these background checks she would have been charged with identity theft, credit card fraud, things that would make it difficult for her to be successful in her career. So she knew that she had to stay out of trouble at least till February. And February, remember, is when she goes missing. That means that at the time that she went missing, she was technically still on probation from this theft. I want to go to February 5th, 2004, which is just a few days before she went missing because something major happens here. And this is what's known as when she has her quote breakdown at work. She worked this part-time job. She was doing security. There's basically like two main theories here. There's one that says that she had this phone call with her sister that was really upsetting. And that's what led to the breakdown. But when I looked into it further, it seems that this phone call was like hours before she had the breakdown and they seem to allude to some other incident, some sort of hit and run allegedly without actually saying it. So I'll just tell you like what the facts are and then you guys decide. At 7.17 p.m., Maura calls her boyfriend Billy and they speak for 20 minutes. She calls him again at 9.56 p.m. and they talk for six minutes. Then eight minutes after that, at 10, 10 p.m., Mara speaks to her sister, Kathleen. This is the conversation that seems to be controversial. It lasts for 28 minutes. Later on, we would find out that the topic of this conversation was that her sister, Kathleen, she's a recovering alcoholic and she just had come out of rehab and her fiance picked her up and I guess took her to a liquor store and so she sort of relapsed. And that was the topic of the conversation. But there seems to be some confusion where people are saying it wasn't that big of a deal. But in any case, that phone call happens. It ends at 1038. Now. An hour and a half after this phone call, there is record of a student in the same university that Maura's from called Patrit Vasi, who got hit by a car and it was a hit and run. Someone hit them and left. This student got hit by a car according to official records at 12.08. At 12.07, Maura called her boyfriend, Billy, and they had a seven minute phone call. At 1 a.m. is when Maura has this quote, breakdown at work. The reason why people bring up this hit and run accident is because it happened like less than a mile from where Maura worked and the phone call she made, there, it's not proven at all. Okay, that's why I'm wearing this tinfoil hat. They said that she was zoned out. She was 
staring blankly. And when they asked her what was wrong, she would only say, my sister, my sister. There is an email here of someone who was there that night who says, quote, that Thursday night, the receptionist had to work until 1.45 a.m. After I visit the other areas of campus, when I got to Southwest, I met up with the other co-workers at the eatery in Southwest. I didn't eat, but another area supervisor told me that Mara was upset and that I should go check on her. At that point, I did. One of them said something's up with Mora. She had been crying. I don't know how to explain it. She was just completely zoned out. No reaction at all. So now it's two days later and her father, Fred, arrives and he's helping her find a new car. He said it blew a cylinder. It was, quote, smoking something fierce and that he told Mora, you can't drive this car. The cops are gonna pull you over in a heartbeat. And he is the one who suggested she put a rag in the muffler. Remember when she, her vehicle was found after the crash, when she went missing, police said that she had a rag stuffed in the muffler. Well, her father says that he told her to do that, to hide the smoke so she wouldn't get in trouble until they could get her a new car. That day, February 7th, two days before she goes missing, her father withdraws $4,000 from several accounts, um, doing like eight ATM transactions because of the limit that you can pull out. And then he said he took that cash and they went car shopping. This is also somehow disputed when you go online because there's people saying like, oh, we contacted the car dealerships. There's no record of this. But he claims that he went car shopping with Mara and that they realized they didn't have enough money, that he was short. And so he said, you know what? I'm going to wait and I'll come back later with more money and hopefully get her the new car that she needs. So after that, Fred, Mara, and Mara's friend Kate, they all go out to like a brewery and they have some food, some drinks, and then the father, Fred, he takes them to a liquor store where they can get some alcohol because they're going to a party. And then he tells Mara, remember, she supposedly has car trouble. He's like, hey, you can take my new Toyota Corolla and drive to the party with the car. Okay, now we are at February 8th in the wee hours. So it's like, 1, 2 a.m., February 8th. Mara's there. Her friend Kate is there. So also another person called Sarah is there. According to people at the party, she kind of mentioned how she wanted to drive the car, her dad's new Toyota Corolla, to his motel and like give him the car. And that Kate was like, that doesn't make any sense. He's not expecting the car tonight. You've been drinking. Like, just give him the car tomorrow. So eventually at 2.30 a.m., Mara's like, all right, I'm going to bed, but she doesn't actually go to her dorm room. Instead, she takes the car and she drives towards her father's motel. In the process of her doing this, she crashes the car. She basically slams the car into a guardrail. It actually ends up causing like almost $10,000 worth of damage to her dad's new car while he's already trying to scrounge up money to get her a new car, right? So someone calls the cops, cops show up, and even though Mara had been drinking, according to her friends, at the scene, police didn't seem to think she was intoxicated. They didn't do a field sobriety test or a breathalyzer. They basically sort of let her go. She ends up driving, like not driving, riding with the tow truck driver to her dad's motel and the vehicle gets towed. Shortly thereafter, she calls her boyfriend, Billy, and she tells him all about it. She's super upset. You know, he said that she was upset about the crash, but then he also alluded to something about she seemed to be upset about something more as well. But her father, you know, wakes up and she tells him what happened. And, you know, he's upset, she's upset, but he says it wasn't that big of a deal because he found out the next day that insurance was gonna cover this. And so, According to him, he didn't think that it would have been super upsetting for Mora um, because the insurance was going to cover it. Her dad ends up renting a car, dropping her off at the university, and then he goes back to Connecticut. That night, he calls his daughter Mora and he tells her, like, you need to get these documents from the DMV so that we can report the accident and, like, get the whole process started. And everything seems fine. The thing is, 
Now we're coming into like midnight and the wee hours of the morning of February 9th. This is the day she goes missing. What happens in these wee hours of the morning are some really disturbing internet searches. First, she searched driving directions to the Berkshires and to Burlington, Vermont. But then she also searched the effects of excessive alcohol consumption on an unborn baby. And this is when people started to wonder if she was pregnant. First of all, she actually had homework that she did submit. Around like 1 p.m., she makes a bunch of phone calls and sends a bunch of emails. She calls this condo in an area where her family had vacationed before to see if they had availability. The condo owner did not have availability. And then she sends an email to her boyfriend, Billy, and it says, quote, I love you more stud. I got your messages, but honestly, I didn't feel like talking too much to of anyone. I promised to call today though. Love you, Mora. And then like about 15 minutes later, she calls a classmate. She leaves a voicemail. Then she sends an email to her work basically telling them that she is going to be out of town for a week because there's been a death in the family. We would find out later that there was no death in the family. Called several places, but she wasn't actually able to book anything that we know of. 2.18, she calls her boyfriend. He doesn't pick up. She leaves a voicemail. The reason why her boyfriend didn't pick up is that while she was calling him and leaving the voicemail, he was calling her friend Kate. Remember the one that went out to the brewery with her dad and at the party, her boyfriend was calling Kate. And then, so she wasn't able to reach him. She leaves a voicemail. Right after that though, her boyfriend calls her like three times back to back. She doesn't answer. At around 3.30, she leaves the campus and she starts driving. We do know though what she took and what she left behind. She took toiletries, a week's worth of clothing. She took her exercise gear. Remember she used to run track and, uh, track and country. What the hell? Car, uh, track and field, cross country. I don't know. But anyway, she took workout clothes. She took a stuffed animal that her dad gave her, a diamond necklace from her boyfriend. She took college textbooks and birth control pills. She had a cell phone charger um, and her cell phone. What she left behind were these boxes. Now, her artwork and stuff that were on the walls were like packed and put into boxes. And there's a little bit of confusion as to whether those things were packed before she came back from the summer or whether she packed them afterwards. But according to police, her stuff was all in boxes and there was a letter, like a printed out note to her boyfriend that according to police, quote, indicated trouble in their relationship. Now, this would also be uh, a controversial thing because according to the boyfriend and his mom, there was no letter, but according to police, there was a letter. So I don't know, about 3.30 and there was snow going on. Classes had been canceled due to a snowstorm that day but she decides to drive. The next thing we see is that at 4 p.m. she is captured on surveillance camera at an ATM where she pulled out $280, which was quote, nearly all of her money. And she was alone at the time, according to what we can see. After she pulls out this $280, she goes to a liquor store. She spends $40 at the liquor store and she purchases uh, Bailey's Irish cream, Kahlua vodka, and a box of Franzia red wine. She starts driving. Now remember, when the vehicle was found after she had the crash, they, the box of wine was there and it seemed to have spilled. There was that soda bottle that was filled with red liquid that smelled of booze. But what wasn't there was the Baileys and the Kahlua. They never found that. Although we know she did purchase that. The last activity that was outgoing from her phone was a phone call she made at 4.37 p.m. where she called her dorm room. The last, last activity on her phone was not an outgoing call, but an incoming call. She got a call at 5 p.m. The only thing that I was able to find about this call was that it was a cell phone and it was coming from within the 20 mile radius of Londonderry, New Hampshire, 
which is a town just north of New Hampshire, Massachusetts border. Thing about it is based on the directions she had in the car and where the vehicle ended up crashing, it seems like at some point there was a change of plans because the printout directions that she had said that she was heading towards Burlington, Vermont or Stowe, but she exited Interstate 91 at exit 17 and headed east on Route 302. Then she turned onto Route 112, which is an area her family says she was familiar with because they would go on tons of vacations there. So if she was maybe having a hard time getting reservations, then maybe she decided to drive somewhere familiar and just get there and see what she could find. She has now gotten into a car wreck again the next day. And it appears just like in that first one, she was drinking and driving. And so maybe now she's like, oh my God, if they find out that I was drinking and driving and I get a DOA, it's over for me. DOA, DUI, it's over for me because I'm already on probation. She probably was panicking. That's why a lot of people think she probably ran away because she did not want to get a DUI. But what happened after that? Then in March of 2004, so right after she went missing, there was another person who went missing under similar circumstances. And her name is Brianna Maitland. She went missing in Montgomery, Vermont, which was like 60 miles from when Mara went missing. And people were starting to think that they were connected, but police came out and they said, no, these two disappearances are not connected at all. They also said that they have not found any evidence that a crime has been committed. They said that there's no foul play. They said they didn't find that she wandered off into the woods. They didn't find any sort of sign of struggle. Then a few months later, towards the end of 2004, this huge bombshell thing happens where this guy called Larry Moulton, he gives Mara's dad a bloody knife that he says, belonged to his brother, Claude Moulton. His brother, he says, lives just a um, hundred yards or something from where the crash site was and that he had a violent history, like criminal with women, and that he and his girlfriend were acting strange uh, around the time that Mara went missing and he found this knife. And so now it was like, wait, did this guy who lived nearby do something to Mora. This also becomes like this controversial thing where the father says, you know, he was trying to give it the knife to police and he was having difficulties like handing it in person. He ends up having to mail it, but he does it where there's like proof of receipt, which he claims that the police did have the knife. The police apparently will not comment on the knife. There's all this information about a letter that was found by the granddaughter of this person where he seems to have a diary entry a day after Maura disappeared where he's saying some things about, you know, she was an angel and I turned her into an angel and I can't stop thinking about that night. Like basically sort of like this confession thing, but that again went nowhere. What police were really, really trying to find was Mora's backpack because she had it with her when she left and it wasn't in the vehicle. It was this black backpack. There was this forum where someone was asking about the backpack and he claimed he saw the backpack. And then another user said that they went to that location and the backpack was there and it was like frozen and that they called the cops. And then when they came back, the backpack was gone. And then when the media caught wind of it and they asked the police about it, the police said they're aware of the backpack. There's sightings of her. People are saying they see her in Canada. They see her over here. And this is when her father sues the police. And this is when the relationship between the family and the police kind of breaks down. The father's like, you guys dropped the ball and you didn't investigate things you should have investigated. And you're saying that she did this willingly. I don't think so. This like this is foul play and you guys aren't looking into it. And it turns into this whole thing. Over the years, there've been a lot of searches, but I think there are a few that are notable that I wanna mention. Uh, the first one is this A-frame of a home that was nearby that is said to be the home of the the guy who his brother gave the dad the bloody knife. So they apparently searched that home and the dogs supposedly went bonkers. And then they ended up finding this sample of carpet that appeared to have blood on it. And some of it was given to the private investigators the family hired. And then some of the carpet was given to the official officers. But then now when you look into it, there's 
inconclusive. Like they haven't really said anything about whether or not there was anything there. And then more recently, what happened was the father was asking for these records to be released. He sued to try to get this information, but he lost. And the reason why he lost is because the prosecutors, they said that they still are working on this case. And if they release this information, it could compromise the case because they said there's quote 75% that they could prosecute someone and that they do have information that this may be a crime. So this is different from what they initially said where they thought she could have done this to herself. And so those are the facts, but now I want to talk about the theories. The first theory is that she ran away or willingly disappeared. Then there's the foul play theory. And then there's the sort of accident, like maybe she just succumbed to the elements theory. So the runaway theory, that was what police initially said. Also, her friend, the one that was with her at West Point when she stole that makeup, she said that they learned a lot of training about like, surviving and being in the wilderness and she really loved the wilderness and she said quote if she wanted to make up another life she could do it if she wanted to disappear she could she never wanted to look bad in front of people after she crashed her father's car and this trouble with the credit cards i think she probably thought if i just disappeared they wouldn't think badly of me i believe she's alive it's just a feeling i've always had and remember the Haas guy, the track and field coach that she dated, he also said that she said she wanted to run away. So if you look at what transpired leading up to it, I mean, it's just like snowball effect where she feels like her life is over if she gets caught. And she's a track and field star, like the witness who saw her running, like maybe she, she was drinking, she just started running. And what happened from there, right? The dogs lost the scent. Did she take a ride with someone and then either reinvent herself or that brings us again to the foul play thing. Did she get picked up by someone in the course of running away and it turned badly? Do you have any theories about, about where your sister is and what may have happened? I believe that she was met with foul play. The things that she took with her. So she took textbooks, she took running gear, she took birth control, she took accident forms. To me, it indicated that she planned to return. Do you believe your sister's alive, Julie? I hope she is, but everything in my gut says that she's not. Maybe she was trying to run away, but someone took advantage of that situation. When you look at the foul play theory, there are a few people that come up. The knife guy, because some of his family members say he was just using it to get money. He was on drugs. Other family members say no, he has a history and he was acting really weird around that time. But then also her boyfriend, he ended up recently, like in 2022, getting SA charges against him. Like he was arrested for SAing a female coworker and the details of that are really messed up where he like took advantage of her at St. Patrick's Day and found her locked in this room and apparently like bent her over. And then it was another coworker that walked in on them. That's when this woman says that Billy, Mara's ex-boyfriend told her, you know, this never effing happened. Like, don't say anything to anyone. And then this, by the way, happened in 2011, but it didn't come to the public's attention until way later, like 10 years later. And according to the uh, victim who brought this forward, she says that she actually went to police the day after it happened. And they gave her a hard time being like, why are you coming now? As if that was like too late. And she felt like, from the pushback she got from police that this probably wasn't gonna end well for her, so she dropped it. But later, later on, when someone was investigating Mara's case and they contacted her when they had heard about this, she realized that, wait a minute, he did this to me and I was afraid to speak out and now there are people thinking that he could have done this to another girl prior. Like, I feel obligated to speak out in case he does this to someone else. And that's when the Billy boyfriend thing really blew up because people are like, wait a minute, could he be involved? But the thing about it is he wasn't there. Like, it seems like police were able to prove that he was in Oklahoma at the time. Remember how I told you in the beginning that even one of the officers like ended up taking his own life and people were accusing him of lying and being involved? Okay, well, this is very sad if it's not true, but it's Officer Cecil Smith. And he was the first responding officer who showed up. But do you remember in the beginning when I told you there was this witness who said that she saw another vehicle, the SUV 001, that showed up earlier and was nose to nose. 
Then later on, according to the records, Officer Cecil shows up in the cruiser in 002. And so some people took that as if he lied about when he arrived and what vehicle and that maybe he was there before and did something and then came and covered it up. But there were so many like accusations about him and certain blogs and things that were so relentless that some people speculate that he actually took his own life because he was being harassed online. But then I found something else that said that he sort of had this illness, but he didn't tell anyone about it. And maybe that contributed to it. I don't know. And then the last foul play suspect that I want to talk about is the bus driver. Remember I told you the bus driver who showed up and later would call the cops. Some people speculated, like, could he have done something because he was the last person to see her? And then between when he saw her and when the cops came, she was missing. Was it him? But other than sort of like that speculation and him being the last person to see her, there really is nothing like substantial that says he did something. Which brings me to the last theory, which is like she succumbed to the elements because it was snowing in her inebriated state of mind. And she's still athletic enough. She could have ran a good distance. Could she have hurt herself somehow, been injured and no one rescued her? It could be a combination of things. It could be she ran at first, then she got met with foul play or she ran at first and then succumbed to the elements or, you know, some combination of those things. I would love to know what you guys think happened to her. If I had to guess, I, I believe that in the initial moments after the accident, I think she did not want to get caught. She knew the repercussions of that. And so initially she may have just been avoiding the police. As to what happened after that, I don't know. I think if she really went and reinvented herself, that seems like the most far-fetched and difficult to achieve thing. If someone took advantage of the situation and harmed her, that's not hard to believe. Same thing with succumbing to the elements. It's just maybe they weren't able to find her remains or something. Um, I don't know. But hopefully they get some answers. But in any case, thank you guys so much for watching. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.